Hi everyone. We will be doing chapter nine this week, which concerns reporting and interpreting liabilities. Specifically, we're gonna be defining and classifying liabilities, talking about current liabilities, long-term liabilities, and then present value. So just a level set here, what we're talking about, we know we have our four financial statements. We have the balance sheet. We have the income statement. We have the statement of owner's equity. We have the statement of cash flows. We know for the balance sheet, our assets equal our liabilities plus stockholders equity. We know for our income statement, our revenues minus our expenses give us our net income or net loss. We know for the statement of owner's equity that there's a common stock equation and a retained earnings equation. Common stock uh, and retained earnings, so it would be beginning plus what you issued minus what you bought back equals your ending. Then for retained earnings, it's your beginning retained earnings plus your net income or minus your net loss minus your dividends equals your ending. And then for the statement of cash flows, we have your beginning cash flows or your beginning cash plus or minus your cash inflows or outflows from operating, investing, and financing activities equals your ending cash. What we're talking about tonight are liabilities, specifically short-term and long-term. Also, I just wanna level set here. Remember we said with the equation, we have T accounts. So we generally have our debits on our left, our credits on our right, and we know that assets increase with the debit, decrease with the credit, liabilities are the reverse, and generally you're gonna debit expenses and credit revenues. So with that, let's look at the PowerPoint. So I have here, liabilities are probable future sacrifices of economic benefits that arise from past transactions. They can be considered current or non-current. So essentially liabilities are things that you as a business own. Um, now the one thing I wanna point out here as I have in the PowerPoint, the amount borrowed is not usually the amount repaid. Um, this deals with payables, note payables. And the idea is, right, if you borrow money from someone, uh, they're gonna charge you interest. So you may borrow, for example, $100, but when you repay it, uh, you may pay, repay $120, so $100 of the principal and $20 of interest. So we know that when we borrow money, so for example, if you borrowed $100 at a 15% interest rate per period, you would debit cash, $100, right, an increase of an asset, credit notes payable for $100. Likewise, we know that when we record expenses, specifically interest expense, you're gonna debit interest expense for 15 and then credit interest payable. So we said that you know, liabilities can be divided into current liabilities and non-current liabilities. With regard to current liabilities, they have a direct relationship with the operating activities of the business. So for example, we finance our activities, how we run the business day to day through our current liabilities. So for example, if we were a coffee shop, how would we fund our coffee inventory, purchase the beans? Well, we would buy it from suppliers on a payable. How do we rent the building uh, that we operate the coffee, coffee house in? Uh, you know, we would accrue the rent. Likewise, our employees, they earn wages. We're gonna accrue those wages. So when we have our accruals, right? We're gonna have our uh, accrued expenses, things like these, the accrued payables, the accrued rent, the accrued wages. 
uh, we use those to run our day-to-day -day, uh, operations of our business. And those are gonna be current liabilities. Now, the main one we had there, uh, you know, for example, we buy the coffee beans, that's gonna be the accounts payable, a liability, right? When you borrow money to, um, you know, fund uh, your operations uh, to buy the coffee beans, so you're gonna debit cash, uh, credits the accounts payable. The one thing with regard to accounts payable that you need to distinguish from notes payable is that when you're talking about accounts payable, they usually don't accrue interest. In other words, if you borrow $100 in this scenario, you would repay $100. And essentially, it's an account. You have a, an open account with a, a vendor. It's kind of like if you were to go to the casino, right? You said, just put this on my account. Or uh, if you were to go to a country club, right? Sometimes at country clubs, you can just uh, say, you know, I want to order this food, just put it on my account, I'll pay it back later. And then you pay back, uh, you know, the amount you borrowed. Other types of accrued liabilities that we were talking about, uh, and when we talk about accruals, right, accrued liabilities, we're going to have the recognition before we pay the cash. Uh, that is to say, uh, the obligation to pay the expense is recognized the liability until it's paid. We have things like taxes payable, uh, accrued compensation. So as I have here for accrued taxes payable, these are taxes incurred in one period, but they're paid in a later period, right? So here's the idea. We make money during the accounting period. Uh, as we do this, you know, at the end of the period, debit tax expense, credit taxes payable. Later, in the next period, when we actually fill out our tax return and send in the payment, we would reverse out the payable um, and then credit cash. Likewise, we have our employees, right? They work for us every month. They're working, they're working. Uh, they don't get paid every day, right? You know, they work a couple weeks and then they get their paycheck two weeks later. So when our employees earn their wages, we're gonna debit wage expense credit wages payable. When we actually pay them, we're gonna reverse out the wages payable and credit cash. So kind of same thing up here, right? You tee up the payable, tee up the payable. When you actually pay it, uh, that's when you reverse out the payable and credit cash. Now I have here, this is where it's gonna be you know, some new material. I have similarly, companies must record an accrued liability uh, for employees benefits that have been accrued, but not yet paid. So debit compensation expense, it's kind of like a wage expense, credit accrued vacation liability or you know, health insurance liability. This is where we also, you know, so we're talking about compensation, right? We talked about wage expense. We have other things that we have to accrue for our employees. One of the liabilities we have to accrue, so you know, credit payable, right? You know, that's what we're talking about, uh, is payroll taxes and other types of taxes on income. So here's the basic idea, right? You earn income at your job. So let's say you get paid $20 an hour. And let's say you work 10 hours. So you should say, well, you know, I should be getting a $200 paycheck, right? I worked 10 hours, I get 20 bucks an hour. Why am I, when I get my paycheck, I'm only getting $175? What's happening here? Well, what is happening is your employer is withholding on your earnings certain obligations you owe on taxes. So it could be income taxes you owe, and uh, it could be other things like your health insurance, or it could be uh, employment taxes, FICA taxes. So as I have here, and these things are called payroll taxes. What they do is they include federal, state, and local income taxes, FICA, and unemployment taxes. The employer or the employee can be responsible. However, the employer always withholds and pays the employee's liability from the employee's earnings. So in other words, how it works is your employer withholds the money, your tax obligation, 
they then send it in to the IRS, the government, right, or the appropriate tax agency. So I have here, employers are required to withhold income taxes from the, from the earnings of the employees. So hey, you're an employee, you make money, you gotta pay income taxes on it. It's withheld by your employer. Likewise, hey, you're an employee, you make money, you have to pay FICA tax on that, uh, on your earnings, and your employer withholds it. What is FICA tax? Essentially, FICA uh, is the, the tax that helps to fund Social Security and Medicare. So Social Security is when you get older and retire. Uh, it helps you maintain you know, a reasonable uh, way of living. And Medicare helps to fund uh, health insurance for you know, elderly individuals. And uh, the idea here is, with regard to FICA, every time you make money, uh, you have to pay FICA on your earnings. However, the employer also has to pay FICA on your earnings. So you pay half of it and they pay half of it. Finally here, FUDA. Uh, so this is uh, federal unemployment. Uh, and there's also SUDA in states. These are taxes that are payable by the employer. So you make money, uh, the employer has to pay taxes. So what all of this means is, if we were to kind of graph this out, right? So we have the employee who works for the business. They make money, $200, right? However, their paycheck only says 175. We know the differences for among other things, taxes, right? The employer withheld $25 in taxes, they withheld it, and then they send it to the IRS. And we said, your earnings $200 on it, so 200 bucks, you as the employee are subject to income tax plus FICA tax. Likewise, on your $200 of earnings, the employer, right, they're subject to FICA plus unemployment taxes. So FICA, essentially to give you a, a very high level overview on it, uh, let's say you make $100,000 on that, let's just say it's 15% to keep it simple. That means there's a $15,000 FICA obligation from your wages. What happens is, this is the whole uh, amount that's owed. However, it's split 50-50, $7,500 you owe, $7,500 your employer owes. So the, uh, that's how it goes back to the employer down here, right? And this is why when employers hire people, it's expensive to hire them because you know when they make money, not only do we have to pay them uh, their money, but we also have to pay our own taxes on your earnings. So I have here uh, two journal entries to record payroll tax. Now, first off, if this is tested on the exam, I'm not going to ask you specifically how to calculate the tax obligations. That's more of a, a tax uh, class. However, I would give you uh, the amounts and you would have to complete the journal entries. So if we look at these, we know that we're accruing a payroll tax. So first off, we paid our employers, uh, our employees, 1387. Uh, and then on that, uh, we've withheld 137 in FICA, we've withheld income taxes, and we're going to debit our compensation expense. In other words, this would be like the $200, right? This would be like your take home, 175 bucks. This is what your employer withheld. Now they, when they do the journal entry for this, because remember, this is their point of view, they have to withhold this uh, and then pay it to the IRS. Because they're sitting on the money uh, and they have, have not yet paid 
the IRS, that's going to be a liability to them because if they don't pay it, they're going to be on the hook for it. So this is the journal entry with regard to the employee liability. So, hey, you're the employee. You make money. We have to withhold taxes on your earnings. That's what we're doing right here. The second journal entry is, the, uh, is that for the employer. In other words, remember I said, hey, employees are expensive. You've got to pay taxes on their earnings. So, hey, our employees, they had these earnings. Looks like uh, we ourselves are going to owe FICA half of it. So they pay half, we pay half, the same amount, right? It's like 7,500, 7,500. We also have to play uh, an insurance on it. Um, so again, this would be an additional compensation expense. We withhold it, and then when we pay it, we reverse out the payables, right? So we've been talking, that's the general theme. Tee up the payable, reverse it out when you pay the cash. Now we have a, a little bit uh, different segue here. This is the reverse, this is a deferred revenue. Uh, so the idea with these are, this is where you get the cash before you earn the cash, right? We said under a gap accrual accounting that we follow the revenue recognition principle, which basically says we only record revenues, that is to say credit revenues, do that journal entry, if and only if we earn the income. So what happens then if somebody pays us before we earn it? So like maybe they give us a deposit or something. Uh, and then later on, two or three weeks later, we provide the services to that individual. We've talked about this before, right? If somebody pays you in advance, debit cash, credit unearned revenue. Then once you earn it, reverse it out, right? It's kind of similar theory, tee it up, reverse it out. Debit unearned revenue, and hey, we earned it. 300 to the extent we provided the services. Another item here are notes payable. So these are to be distinguished from uh, accounts payable because they're a formal written contract. And also where they're distinguished is uh, you have to pay interest on a notes payable, right? So think about a note, right? You rip out a note from your notebook, right? You write up a very specific contract. Uh, I'm gonna borrow this much money and I have this much interest rate. Notes payable are very formal. They have an interest rate. How do we calculate interest expense, right? So we're talking about expenses, accruals. Well, how we do it is we take the interest uh, for the period, how we get this, we take the principal, which is the amount we borrowed, times the annual interest rate, so that would be stated in our little agreement here, times the number of months that have passed over 12 months. So let's look at an example here to illustrate this, how we would calculate interest expense. So it looks like, hey, on November 1st, a company with a 1231 year end borrows $100,000 for cash for one year. The annual interest rate is 12%. So, hey, we borrow some money, you gotta pay interest on it. It looks like the interest is payable on April 30th in October 31st of year two, um, the following year. However, remember, because we follow GAAP, we don't just wait You know, necessarily when you have a cash outflow uh, to record your expenses. We accrue our expenses as they're incurred. Uh, finally here, the principal is payable on October 31st. So just to summarize, we borrow 100 grand right here. We have to fully pay it off right here with interest. However, because we're applying gap accrual, we have to, at certain intervals, record our interest expense. So let's start at the beginning, right? In the beginning, on November 1st, we record the note payable. So what that means is, hey, we borrowed some money. We now have more cash, debit cash, credit note payable, a liability. Now, here we are at 1231, right? So two months have passed. We had November and we had December that have passed. We need to, following GAAP, accrual accounting principles, accrue our interest expense, right? So we've been talking about these, tee up the payable, tee up the payable, reverse it out once you pay the payable. 
So we're going to use our formula here. We know we borrowed 100,000 times 12% annual interest rate. Two months have passed, right? We got November, we got uh, December, we're at the end of December. That means we're going to have $2,000 interest expense. So debit interest expense, credit payable. So now we're moving on. It's the end of the year. We're, we know per the terms and conditions, right, uh, that we need to make uh, our first payment of interest on 430, right? We said, we said that back here. Interest is payable on April 30th. Interest is payable on 1031. So what happens is right here, hey, on 430, they want the interest paid, the amount of interest that's paid, the cash that goes out is all of the interest that's accrued from 11.1 until there. We know already from the last journal entry that we accrued interest for these two months. What that means is four more months have passed, we need to accrue interest for those four months. After we accrue that interest, we push it out. So we teed up the payable and we push it out. So what that means is step one is accrue four more interest, four more months of interest. So 100,000, 12%, four more months. That gives us $4,000 of interest expense. Now, here we are, 430. We gotta make our first payment under the contract we agreed to, pay the interest for all that time that's passed. So we know from this journal entry for these two months, we've accrued 2,000. We know from this journal entry, we've accrued 4,000. What that means is our interest that we owe right here is 6,000. So we pay the interest, the cash, send the cash payment out, reverse out that payable that we teed up. Next, we're moving along the timeline here, right? It's six months later, right? We gotta do two things here. We have to pay off the note. We have to pay our second interest payment and we have to accrue the interest, right? So, uh, seven more months we have right here. That's uh, just to clarify. So, first thing we got to do is record the interest expense for the seven months, right? Because we accrued the interest expense. We follow GAAP accrual accounting. We're going to do 100,000 times 12%, seven months over 12 months. That means $7,000 of interest. Likewise, we need to pay our second payment, our second interest payment. Well, we paid our interest for all of this already up to here. We've accrued our interest for 430 to 1031. Now we got to pay it. So we teed up the payable, reverse it out, credit cash. We actually had a cash outflow. Finally, 1031, pay back the 100 grand you originally borrowed. Reverse out the payable, credit cash. So, we're going to be moving, uh, you know, continuing along the, the current liability scheme here. Um, one of the things uh, that you need to be cognizant of is the current portion of long-term debt. What does that mean? So, hey, we have a payable, right? We signed an agreement. We got to pay stuff over the next five years, for example. However, some of that that we have to pay, maybe it's installments a little bit this year, a little bit next year. To the extent we have a long-term liability that is due in the current year, so to the extent the portion or the amount of a long-term debt that's due in the current year, within the next year, that's considered a current liability, right? Because we said the line of demarcation is one year. So if you expect to pay it in the next year, that's a current liability. So to the extent you have uh, a long-term liability that you're going to pay in the next year, that's a current liability. Another liability that we could have on our balance sheet is a contingent liability. And there's two ways that this can arise, through a warranty expense or a lawsuit. So what does this mean? First off, when you say the word contingent, right, it's contingent on something happening, right? Uh, you know, so maybe I will arrive uh, at dinner, contingent upon there not being traffic, right? Essentially, it's conditional. Um, and what we're doing here is we're dealing with estimates, right? Uh, and the first example are warranties. So here's the story, right? You're selling a product. Let's say you're selling, um, 
coffee machines because we're dealing coffee. When you sell them, right, you say, okay, I give you a warranty on this coffee machine. If this thing breaks in the next six months, come and return it. Uh, we'll give you a refund. Well, what happens is some customers actually take you up on that, right? Maybe the coffee machine breaks, they return it. Uh, what you do in that case is you have an expense, right? It's kind of like, it's, it's in some ways like the opposite of a bad debt expense in the sense that uh, somebody's returning something, now you have bad product. But the idea is you have a warranty expense. The idea, some customers are gonna take you up on this and it's gonna cost you money when they return it. But here's the idea. We don't wait uh, until uh, our customers actually return the item to have the expense. In other words, just like with bad debt expense, we make an estimate and then we true it up after the fact, we follow the same format for warranty expense. So hey, when we sell our coffee machines, we make an estimate uh, of what our warranty expense is gonna be. Once the customers utilize that warranty, that hey, they return the coffee machine, uh, we reduce out the payable. So take the expense up front, reduce out the payable. Another type of contingent liability here, so it's subject to something happening, right? So the warranty is contingent upon them actually returning it. Lawsuits are contingent uh, in the sense that, hey, we sell a product, a coffee, a coffee machine. What happens if that burns somebody and it burns them? Uh, the temperature is extremely hot, more than what a reasonable person would expect. We could be facing a lawsuit. Uh, now, let's just say that we know something bad has happened with our product, right? Maybe it burned somebody, a hot, a hot coffee. Um, we know that a lawsuit's in the works and that they're going to be suing us. Now, there's a couple different things here, right? It's contingent, first off, because we don't know if they're going to win the lawsuit. Uh, you know, we can't, we can only like make a prediction, right? You don't know if you win until you actually win. So what that means is, uh, we have to make an estimate about the outcome, how much, like, what are the chances that this goes through? And Hey, if it does go through, what's it going to cost us now, depending on, uh, how predictable or, you know, our predictability level, if it's probable, reasonably possible or remote plus our ability to estimate the amount from the lawsuit, that determines and controls how we report it on the balance sheet or if we put it in the footnotes or if we don't report it. So just the level set, the idea here is we're facing a potential lawsuit. Should we put this as a liability on our balance sheet or should we disclose it in the footnotes or should we just not include it at all? What are the rules? What are the criteria here? So there's two things here. It depends on how likely the lawsuit is going to succeed and if we can estimate what it's going to cost us. The big thing here that I have in red is when does it go as a liability on the balance sheet? Well, when it's probable and you can reasonably estimate what it's going to cost you. Otherwise, you're going to disclose in the footnotes or if it's remote or you can't estimate what it's going to cost you, no disclosure. So we're in the realm of current liabilities. Another thing with current liabilities that are relevant is working capital. What is working capital? Well, it's our current assets minus our current liabilities, right? We're talking about liabilities. Essentially, as I have here, working capital reflects the amount left over if a company used its current assets to pay off its current liabilities. It's a measure of the company's liquidity. That is to say, how quickly can it pay off its obligations? It also measures how efficient the business is and its short-term health. So one thing with working capital that we gotta be careful about is that we're managing it correctly. So if it's too low, we may not be able to pay off our short-term obligations. Uh, higher working capital shows the ability of the company to grow uh, however, you don't want it to be too high. Uh, have a nice balance in light of uh, how efficiently and effectively you want to run your business. Now we're moving to long-term liabilities. So again, we're on the balance sheet. We're talking about liabilities, long-term liabilities here. Here's the idea, right? 
you go on Shark Tank. I have a really great idea. Um, you know, what's I'm trying to think? Uh, sponge Daddy, right? Like the little sponge that's the smiley face sponge. Hey, we're, we have Sponge Daddy. This is our idea. We know that it's a, you know, a million dollar idea, but we don't have funds to start our business. So we go on there and we get money from one of the sharks, right? And they lend us the money, right? So there's generally two ways uh, that you can obtain money to run your business, right? You can borrow money or you can let somebody buy into your business, right? They get stock. Now, when you borrow money, there's two ways you can borrow money to run your business. You can borrow money by issuing a bond or you can have a long-term note payable from a private lender. So this would basically be like borrowing money from a shark. And when we do this, and we said, hey, notes payable, right? They accrue interest. We need to make sure that we're appropriately accruing interest. Now with bonds, these are gonna be next chapter, but it's just setting the stage uh, with this chapter when we talk about present value, future value. Uh, with regard to bonds, this is essentially the business receiving a loan or borrowing money. Bondholders uh, who view the bond as an investment provide the business with money for in exchange for the bonds. Later, the business pays the bondholders interest and at maturity, the principal. So the business, like the sponge daddy, they're the issuer. They issue the bond and receive the money to go and fund the business. They got to pay that back with interest. Bondholders, are, that's like the sharks, right? They're the investor. Um, now again, it's difference between a note payable uh, and uh, a bond in the sense that bonds are more publicly traded. But the general idea is the same. You're borrowing money. And with it, you borrow it, you have a liability, and then you accrue interest expense with the passage of time, just like uh, the note payable where we accrued the interest expense before. Leases, we've talked about these. Uh, this is just another way uh, that you can have uh, uh, an obligation or expense to acquire property to run your business. We said the lessor is the person who owns the property. The lessee is the person who uses the property. So it's kind of like landlord tenant. And we distinguish between an operating lease and or a capital uh, finance lease. And we said generally, you know, we're not gonna worry too much about this uh, for purposes of this class. It's more of an advanced financial accounting class, but we're just teeing it up and getting some familiarity with terms. So if and when you do study this later on, you're a little bit familiar with it. So this is where uh, things start to tee up a little bit. You need to pay attention carefully. Uh, we're talking about long-term liabilities, right? And we're saying you borrow money and then you pay interest, pay interest, pay interest, and then pay back what you borrowed. With that, uh, we're starting to get into the territory here of an annuity. So an annuity is a special financial term, right? You may have heard of it before, a fixed annuity, this annuity. Really what an annuity is, is a series of consecutive payments for an equal do dollar amount over the same period of time when the same interest rates at play. Now, depending on if you make your payment at the end of the month, that's an ordinary annuity. If you make your payment at the beginning of the month, uh, that would be an annuity due. One way you can think of an annuity, right? You go and buy a vehicle. Hey, I wanna borrow, uh, buy a vehicle here. I sign an agreement uh, with 4% interest rate. Every month to pay off my vehicle, I gotta pay $500 a month for the next five years. That's considered uh, an annuity, that arrangement, right? Every month you're making a series of, you know, uh, you know you're making a payment, uh, so $500 every month at the same interest rate, 4%. And why we're talking about time value, money, future value here, again, to link this back, we're talking about, and this is gonna build in next, next chapter with bonds. Um, so when you're thinking about all of this, be cognizant that it's tying into long-term liabilities and bonds, but we're setting the framework right here. So what does this mean, time value of money? Well. The thing you got to think about with this is a dollar today is worth more 
than a dollar tomorrow. What does that mean, right? So here you are today, here you are three days from now. If you pull up a dollar bill and hold it in front of your hand, if you take that dollar today and you put it in the stock market and it earns interest or uh, you know it, it increases in value, that dollar in three days from now, that's gonna be worth more than a dollar if you're holding it up uh, in three days from now, a single dollar bill. So this is called the time value of money. And essentially what it's saying is, uh, if you invest money, it can earn interest and it's gonna grow. And there's two scenarios here. We have future value and we have present value. And with regard to future value, what we're saying here is, okay, in light of the time value of money, that is to say, I can invest my money and it earns interest, what will my money be worth in the future? What will it grow to? What will be its future value? And there's two scenarios here. You can make one deposit. You know, I put you know, 100 bucks in. What's that going to grow to in two years from now? Or you can have the future value of an annuity, right? We said an annuity is a series of payments for the same amount. So I put $100 in, $100 in, $100 in every three months. What collectively, five years from now, is that going to be worth? So that's what we're dealing with here, the high level, the future value what something is worth in the future in light of the time value of money. Present value is the reverse. So essentially what we're saying here is, hey, we know that uh, there is this thing called the time value of money where money can earn interest. Well, what is something in the future? Uh, if we know that it's, you know, we're gonna get this much in the future, what do we have to invest today to get to that amount. In other words, we're gonna shrink down, take a big amount in the future, and shrink it down to what it's worth today in light of the time value of money. And again, there's two things that we can shrink down. Uh, a single amount, so if we you know, take, if we want $500 in the future, what do we have to invest today? What do we shrink that $500 down to today such that if we invest it today and it earns interest, what's it gonna, how will it will get to $500? Likewise, the present value of an annuity. We want $500 in the future. What do we shrink that down to if we make a payment every three months? What do we have to put in there every three months in light of uh, accruing interest to get $500? So let's start and kind of go back. We talked high level time value of money there's present value, there's future value, there's a single amount, there's a, an annuity. Let's talk about these one at a time. And I have kind of simple examples to keep it straight in your head. First, the future value, so what's something worth in the future, of a single amount. Now I have here as a simple example, think about growing your savings account. So what we're saying here is, uh, if you put $100 today into your savings account, and it earns interest, what will it be worth three years from now if there's a 5% interest rate? So the idea here is you put 100 in, the future value in three years is 115. Now, there's a couple different ways we can do this, that we can figure out what the future value of, of something is. You can use an equation with these variables you can manually calc it. So, you know, after year one, uh, you know, it earns $5 interest. Now you have 105. After year two, it earns, you know, an additional interest. Add them all up. Here's the equation that we talked about. So you can manually do it to see what it's worth in the future. You can use uh, a formula to figure it out. Or alternatively, and what you're going to need to know on the exam is use a, is use a table. So here's the idea. First off, anytime you use a table, you got to make sure you're using the right table. So right here, we know we're trying to figure out the future value of a single payment. We put 100 bucks in, a single payment. What's it going to grow to in the future? So in other words, it's going to be, we know it's a 5% interest rate. We know after three years, so this is going to be the factor. So we take that factor and we multiply it by the $100 we put in, 
That's going to give us the future value. Likewise, we're talking about single amount here. What's the present value of a single amount? So this is kind of the reverse. So this is asking how much should I invest today? Not what it's gonna to grow to. So in other words, if I want $115 in three years from now, what do I need to put in the bank today such that in three years it grows to $115? Well, same interest rate, couple different ways we can do this. We can manually calc it. We can use a formula to figure it out. In other words, you know, we know we have to put in $100 today to, to get there. How do we figure that out? Or alternatively, we can use the table. And when we use the table, we got to make sure we're using the right table. So the present value of a single payment, we know it's a 5% interest rate, three periods, 0.86. So we want 115.76 in the future. Multiply that by the present value factor. That means we got to put $100 in today. The next one here, the future value of an annuity. So we said, hey, an annuity is a series of consecutive payments for the same amount. What's the future value of that going to be? I have as a simple example, think of a yearly IRA, retirement contribution. So, hey, you're working your job every year. You put a thousand bucks in your IRA at the end of the year, year one, year two, year three. In the future, what is that going to be worth? Uh, you know, those, those series of payments you made. That's the idea here, the future value of an annuity. So, hey, you do that a thousand, a thousand, a thousand. At the end of year three, some of this is earned interest. It's worth 3,100. I'm going to assume here a 6% interest rate. How do we calculate that? Well, you could do a manual calculation. That would be you know, complex. You could uh, use Excel. You could use Excel for all of these. Uh, or you could use the tables, which like I said, we're gonna use the tables. Now with regard to the tables, uh, technically here you could combine two tables. So each of the deposits find their future value. Or the easier way to do it is use the table for the future value of an annuity. So what you do here, we got 6% interest rate, three periods, 3.18360. So $1,000 each payment times the factor gives us 31.83. So the last one here is the present value of an annuity. So this is kind of shrinking down payments to what they're worth today, a series of payments. Now I have here uh, taking the lump sum if win a lottery. It basically just means comparing the lump sum uh, with a series of future payments. So imagine this, you won the lottery and are offered uh, two choices. You can either take a million dollars at the end of each year for the next three years, or we'll give you $2.5 million today. Well, we know that uh, you know the time value of money, if we get that 2.5 million, we could invest it and make money. What's the better scenario here? What should we do if we have a 7% interest rate? Well, you're gonna present value, so the annuity, the three payments, to what it's worth today. And what it's worth today is 2.6 million. So in other words, if you were to take this option, 1 million at the end of the next three years, in today's money, that's 2.6 million. When you present value it, shrink it down. Because 2.6 is greater than 2.5, or stated alternatively 2.5, is less than 2.6, you'd actually end up getting more money overall by taking the annuity, by taking uh, this option right here, each of the next three years. So how do we calculate this? A couple of different ways. You can manually calc it, you can use Excel, you could uh, present value each of the payments, or the easiest you can do is use the present value of an annuity table. So how this works is, we know it's a 7% interest rate, we know three years, that gets us the factor. We take the $1 million payments times the factor that gives us the 2.6 million. 
Now, a couple kind of uh, clarification points here. We're talking about long-term liabilities, right? You may borrow money and have to pay it off in the future. Present value and future value, these are important in those determinations, in those calculations, because they help tell us, hey, how much money do we need today such that in light of the time value of money, uh, if we invest it, we could pay something off in the future. What will it grow to? What, what cash do we need to have today to pay off what we owe in the future? Now, how this is important for a note payable, right? We want to present value a single amount. So what are we going to have to present value today such that in the future when we got to pay off the note payable that we have enough money to pay it off? Uh, likewise, for bond interest expense, you know, we said with bonds, right? There's generally you borrow money, a lump sum. Then every uh, period you make a payment for interest. And at the very end, you pay off what you borrowed. Well, what we need to do there is present value those two things, the series of interest payments, as well as uh, that lump sum payment at the end. This is just a, a further point of clarification. Uh, to the extent this specific chapter is on the exam, uh, it will be a annual interest period. Bonds, however, it is fair game to have a non-annual interest period. So in other words, what this all is saying is, Everything we've been looking at so far assumes a yearly interest rate. So it compounds the interest, it adds on to the principal um, at a yearly interval. So you have $100,000, 7% interest. At the end of one year, there's $7,000 interest. You add that to the $100,000 you borrowed, such that when you then calculate your next year interest rate, you're gonna multiply it by $107,000, and that happens annually there. However, can the interest can compound, that is be added to the principal on a non-annual basis. Uh, so quarterly, half year, monthly, daily. This is how you would co uh, convert a non-annual interest rate to an annual interest rate. Now, why you would do that, why would you convert it? So you can use the tables. Like, so for example, these are based off, uh, you know, compounding interest rate for one period. So let's look at a couple examples here for how uh, you know all of this ties together, right? We're talking about long-term liabilities and we're saying how does present value and future value affect these? So when we look at this example, it says on 1-1-19, the company buys a delivery truck and signs a note payable of $200,000 to be paid Two years later, let's assume a market interest rate of 12%. So the first thing we got to do on the date of entry is record uh, what it is we receive. So debit delivery truck, credit, note payable. However, notice here, we're not doing it for 200,000, right? We're doing it for 159,000. How did we get that? What is going on here? Well, what we did is, okay, we have $200,000. We know it's two years and there's a 12% interest rate. So what we're trying to figure out here is what do we put away now such that in two years, it will grow to 200,000, a single amount. So we're gonna use the present value of a dollar. So that means the present value of a single amount to distinguish that from the present value of an annuity we're gonna say 12% for two periods. It's gonna give us 0.79. So we take 200,000 times the 0.79, that's gonna give us 159,000. So that's on January 1st of year one. At the end of year one, right, 12 months have passed, we now have to calculate interest expense for the year. So we take the 159, that we got from up here times 12% gives us roughly $19,000 in interest expense. So debit interest expense, credit, note payable, increase the note payable by 19,000. But check it out, our note payable started at 159, we just increased it by 19. So that means it goes to 178, 159 plus 19. This is relevant uh, 
because when we calculate our next interest expense, we have to base it off of this amount. So we borrowed on January 1st, it's the end of year one, we've accrued interest expense. We now have a bigger note payable. Another year has passed, so we're at the end of year two. We have to calculate interest expense for year two. So the current balance of our note payable is 178,000, right here, the carrying value, times 12%. That's going to give us a year two interest expense of 21000 So debit interest expense, credit note payable. But check it out. This takes our note payable, 178 plus 21. That's going to take us to the full 200000 Such that at the end of the two years, right, we, have, we got to pay back the face. We're going to reverse out our entire note payable. It's now worth 200,000 because it started at 159. We increased it by 19. We increased it by 21, all with credits. Now we reverse it out with a debit and we pay the cash. Second example here, let's look at this. So when we look at it, it says, hey, on January 1st of year one, the company buys several machines and signs a note payable. Uh, to make three end of year payments for roughly 163,000. So payments are due at the end of year one, end of year two, and end of year three. We're gonna assume the note is subject to an 11% interest payment. So what's going on here on 1-1-19, year one, we buy a machine with a note payable, debit machine, credit note payable. How do we know what to put in there? Well, essentially what we're gonna do when we do this is we're gonna present value those three payments of $163,000 to what they're worth today, find their present value. So we're talking about a series of consecutive payments, right? So we know that's an annuity. So we're gonna go to the annuity table down here, uh, future value of an annuity. But check it out, this is a testing here for you. We did the future value of an annuity. Future value, that's wrong. Oops. We're trying to find the present value of an annuity. So this is just showing you, hey, you have to be really careful when you're looking. First off, are we using the present value or are we using the future value? See how it goes present, 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 future, future future, future. And likewise, once you do that, you gotta say, am I doing a lump sum or am I doing an annuity? So here, uh, like I said, we're doing the present value of an annuity, 11%, three periods, 2.44. Let's see here, 2.44, we were on uh, this slide. So we take the payment, 163 times that factor, that's gonna give us 399,000. Now, we gotta uh, calculate interest expense at the end of year one. So we're gonna take the 399,000 times the 11%. That's gonna give us a $44,000 interest expense. Uh, we know that per the terms and conditions, we're paying cash of 163,000. So what we do here is we reduce the note payable with a plug, 119,000. Next, uh, we're continuing on here. We need to figure out what happens at the end of the next year, 1231.20. So we reduced the note payable to 280,000. Uh, again, in the first example A, we built it up. Now we're reducing it down. So it's gonna be 280,000 times 11%. That gives us 30,000, your two interest expense. So you interest expense, the cash we know we're gonna pay out, plug the difference for note payable to reduce it down. Finally here, at the end of the year three, we have a new carrying value for it. You know, we started uh, with a certain amount, we adjusted it and we adjusted it again. We take the 147 times the 11%, that gives us year three interest expense. We know that's our cash, plug the note payable for 147,464. Finally here, uh, we're gonna talk about the account payable turnover ratio. So this measures how quickly management pays its suppliers. The higher the ratio, 
the more it suggests the business is paying its suppliers in a timely manner. Uh, essentially, it's your cost of goods sold over your average accounts payable. And it's essentially just looking at uh, how effective are you at paying off your payable. So this is a ratio that shows that. So with this, we're going to move uh, into the problem. So that will be the second lecture.